Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of our Speak Out series. My name is Rally Chakarova, and I'm the Executive Director of the Bolt Foundation and the moderator for today's career discussion focusing on carpentry. The Bolt Foundation has a very simple but important mission to inspire the next generation of construction professionals right here in the greater Toronto area. One way to do that is to ensure that young people have the information they need to choose a career that they're passionate about and can be successful in. This series facilitates discussions on the in-demand careers in construction and how young people can get started. Each panel is made up of industry professionals, including union reps, employers, and apprentices, to provide useful insights into the education and training requirements, physical demands, what to expect day-to-day, -day, and advancement opportunities within the specific construction career. I want to acknowledge and thank our series sponsor, RBC Future Launch, for their generous support for this important initiative to help close the information gap and get more youth interested in construction careers. Let's hear from our sponsors now. Hi everyone, my name is Mark Beckles and I'm the Vice President of Social Impact and Innovation here at RBC. Today, youth are the most unemployed age group in Canada with almost 800,000 young Canadians not currently in employment, education, or training. Canada's skilled tradespeople that have long been the backbone of our economy are more critical than ever. And so is solving this sector's main challenges, the underrepresentation of women and immigrants, the need to double down on digital training, and the ongoing stigmas around trades careers. And while these challenges are significant, so are the opportunities. Through the RBC Future Launch partnership with Bolt, we aim to ensure that you understand what opportunities are available in the skilled trades industry and how to get started in a career that you are passionate about. Because at RBC, we see a future in your future. Today's discussion focuses on careers in carpentry. And trust me when I tell you, there are many career options than you think there are and we have a fantastic industry panel here to dive into that discussion. But first, let's take a quick look at what a career in carpentry looks like on a high-rise residential site. The trim carpenters. Before the drywall is installed, the first task for the trim carpenters is to install pieces of plywood called blocking between the steel studs to provide a strong backing that is used later when fastening other materials securely to the wall. Here you can see blocking has been installed in a bathroom and here you can see that blocking has been installed to securely mount a TV on the wall. Once the drywall work is finished and the painters have primed the walls, the trim carpenters return to install the doors and the frames. The door frames arrive on site already cut, prepared and partially assembled. The carpenter sets the door frame plumb into the opening and levels it and then attaches the door frame to the door opening using an air-powered nail gun. Being organized is important. Each carpenter builds their own workstation on wheels that they take with them from unit to unit. The sliding pocket doors are installed at this time as well. After the doors are installed, the trim carpenters measure, cut and install baseboards at the bottom of the walls. As well at this time, they prep the doors and the frames for the door hardware by drilling out the doorknobs and the latches. Here you can see the carpenter is utilizing a site fabricated jig that speeds up the process and makes the work consistent. In the hallways, the trim carpenters also install an elaborate set of trim around the suite entry doors to give them a luxurious appearance. Later in the process, after all the painting is finished, the trim carpenter returns one more time to complete what they call their back trim phase. This includes the installation of doorknobs, locks, and all other miscellaneous hardware. There are other areas in a condo building where trim carpenters use their skills to build out rooms such as this combined meeting room and theater room, and this sauna. While this visual may be one of the best known areas of carpentry, it is just a part of an exciting career in carpentry. So without further ado, let's meet our panel. Paul, let's start with you. Please tell us about your role, your organization, and how you got started in this career. 
Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Trimble. I am the apprenticeship coordinator at the College of Carpenters. I have not always had this role. Uh, I spent the last 20 years or so working out in the field as a general carpenter, working in many different aspects of our trade. Uh, I spent the better part of 10 to 15 years working as a construction foreman prior to moving into the College of Carpenters to try to help to get other people involved in the trade. Thanks so much, Paul. Steve, let's go over to you. Hi, my name is Steve Skopa. I work for Exclusive Carpentry Enterprises Limited. I'm a general foreman. Uh, I started as, as an apprentice about 20 plus years ago now. And um, I didn't have any prior knowledge to the trade. I was just willing to learn uh, just through hard work and determination. Uh, I acquired all the skills and knowledge that brought me here uh, today. Um, you'll find that all the skills you acquire through carpentry are actually very useful, even just at home in your general life. So you can, it'll be a lot of helpful to do like general little repairs on your house. It teaches you a lot. Um, as for our company, we've been around for 45 years. Uh, we've been, we were very grateful to Tridel. They gave us all the opportunity to do the work for them and be as a part of the, of their team and their family. Um, in order to continue these relationships, you always need to keep up the high quality of their standards. Uh, we're, we're also looking for, always looking for very dedicated and hardworking youth uh, that are willing to be part of our team and keep up with the standards and excellence, excellence of Tridel. Um, as you'll, uh, as you'll see probably throughout uh, the program, we install doors, metal frames, uh, metal doors, baseboard, uh, hardware, millwork. We build hoist stocks, we do parapet blocking. So there's a lot of general aspects to trim carpentry. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Steve. Rock, we'll go over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. My name is Rokaya Gay, but people call me Rock. So I'm originally from uh, Senegal in West Africa. And uh, I grew up, but I grew up in Toronto for um, 30 plus years now. Uh, I have two beautiful young adults uh, where my um, son uh, was an, is an entrepreneur since he was 19. And my daughter graduated from University U of T. Um, University of Toronto uh, last year and uh, with uh, two majors and one minor. For me, I worked um, in a, in a well-known telecommunication company and changed career and decided to come into the trade. And I got connected to the Toronto Community Benefit Network, which is a non-for-profit uh, non labor coalition um, organization that uh, finds meaningful career into the trade for BIPOC people, meaning uh, black, indigenous, People of color into um, uh, people of color into the trade, and uh, I got started. They connected me with Carpenters Union. I would say in 2020 during uh, the pandemic, and ever since uh, it's been history. Just passionate, in love with anything to do with construction, the architectural design when we're building, and just I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I love that. Thank you so much, Rock. And Delio, over to you. Hi, my name is Delio Vieira. I'm a carpenter, uh, Red Seal carpenter. I'm currently working at the uh, College of Carpenters as an instructor. I started off uh, when I was in high school, I worked at a lumberyard, which gave me exposure to all the material that I liked working with. And uh, I'd get discounts and I would just build stuff at home for friends and family. And then I started, uh, I, when I finished school, I went into renovations. So I, I renovated a lot of houses in Toronto. And then later on in my career, I joined the union and that's when I did the ICI, Industrial Commercial Institutional Buildings. And that's when I started doing formwork and scaffold, mostly formwork. And that's when we started doing the skeleton for high rise buildings. That's fantastic. Uh, it's already so great to see sort of the variety of your careers and, and the different walks of um, uh, life that uh, that have helped you uh, come to, the, to where you are right now. And I, I love the application uh, for at home as well. So 
uh, just huge diversity of options as part of these careers. So uh, let's dive into our discussion because we've already gotten uh, a number of questions. Um, so from your introductions alone, we can gather that carpenters can be some of the first trades on site. Um, for example, with the scaffolding, the forming end, and some of the last one uh, with some of the finishing uh, touches that we saw in the video. Um, so I'd love to dive and start right off from the differences. So Paul, let's start with you. Can you give us a broad overview of the different careers that are available in carpentry and some of the different aspects of it and how they differ from one another? Okay, so under the carpentry umbrella nowadays, we have many, many different jobs going on, uh, many different ways that you can move yourself we start out, like you had said, with layout of the building. <clears throat> we have carpenters that are, are working on all that surveying, make sure that our buildings are built to the proper elevations and put in their proper locations. Uh, from there, we see formwork carpenters moving in to do footings, foundations. Sometimes we'll see the buildings on top built of wood, metals. Uh, sometimes it's concrete all the way up. From there, we have people coming in doing scaffolding, a lot of access egress style work. We're seeing scaffolding really used in a lot of renovation and restoration style work nowadays. We can encase a, a, a building in scaffolding, in turn, cover all of that in a plastic like product, be able to remove windows, doors, you know, not have to worry about any damage to our buildings. Uh, from there, <clears throat> sorry, we'll be looking at people doing the building envelope. It's the building envelope that helps to keep the outside weather outside and the inside weather in. Insulation, vapor barriers, uh, different membranes that are used in that process. Uh, we look at some of the exterior finishes that are happening on these buildings. Okay, so carpenters are involved in all of the exterior finishes other than brick or stone. Then we start to move to interior finishes of our buildings. <clears throat> Sorry, and interior finishes could be cabinets, millwork, doors, trims, fancy wood paneling, um, you know, decorative pieces of work. Then we look at also all of the door hardware, all of the accessories that are around the buildings. From there, we'll have some individuals install all the locks, and that kind of wraps up that project. So you were correct in saying that a carpenter is there from the initial layout of a building right to the last door lock. That's really what helps our individuals be able to grow, move into different aspects of trade, perhaps business ownership, um, school instructors, teachers, we see people that are moving into positions of project managers, site superintendents, really the starting of a trade or starting of the carpentry trade really can help you move in, in many, many different directions. Absolutely. And thank you so much. That was such a fantastic overview because, again, I don't think people realize all of the different options that are available with them. Uh, for them under something like carpentry. <laughs> it's, uh, it really hides all of those options. So um, let's start talking a little bit more about all of those uh, in-depth uh, scaffolding. I love that you talked about that. I don't think that's something that people realize that is done by carpenters and something that's so important, especially in a city like uh, Toronto, you see that everywhere. So Rock, we'll go over to you. Um, I know you're working in scaffolding right now. So we'd love to hear a little bit about what that looks like uh, for your day-to-day -day as an apprentice and what skills someone should have to be successful in this trade. These are all excellent questions. Um, thank you very much, Riley. For, um, as a scaffolder, what I would do um, every day, like in the, in the morning, what we'll do is just, um, First, I'll explain what a scaffolder, just in depth, uh, Paul Trimble, thank you for providing those details. Uh, we will build a temporary elevated platform or stru and structure, or structure, and then we use it, uh, it's used to support workers, um, material, um, access and egress, just like Paul Trimble mentioned. And it's made of either steel frame or aluminum 
sometime wood or fiberglass, but as we were using really um, the steel, um, steel steels. And also at the site, what we do is we help other workers to be able to complete their work because once we have those um, structures in place, they'll be able to, like the bricklayer will be able to um, like really complete the, their, the finishing. We have um, the electrical, uh, the electrician that will be able to do what they, um, and we'll be able to also uh, finish the wiring, so on and so forth. So my day to day is really uh, amazing, very creative, because what we do is it's an entire team of uh, scaffolders. We're about maybe, I would say about 19 at the downtown site at the well, and we are divided into small groups, and then we'll be there making sure that uh, those uh, platforms are, uh, we either we're building or we're dismantling every day. So we get to uh, communicate a lot, get to um, really work out because the body is working out a lot. I'm trying to just see how I could give you uh, an idea. For a scaffold, depending on where you're working, you could ha we have the welded frame or the tube and clamp, uh, which is heavy gauge galvanized tubes. Uh, made of seals, or we have the system. But at my workplace, we use the systems scaffold, and they are extremely high because we're helping high rise um, building. <laughs> so, sorry, I'm just uh, trying to give you all the details. But no, this is pretty, great. It's pretty exciting, and you get to really learn with a journey person because I'm a second year apprentice. So the, the journey person, they match us with a journey person who would give us all the details. He will look at the blue, the, the prints and from there we will put the base and then build uh, really high. When I joined the team, uh, it was last year uh, downtown and we are like, I don't know if anybody can go and Google the well.ca and you will see we have one of the biggest scaffold in Ontario. So it's pretty interesting and very creative. Uh, I actually was uh, by there, I think two or three months ago and uh, it was phenomenal. I couldn't believe it. It was just, it, it was the largest one I've ever seen and the most intricate. And I guess I would say uh, safety must be extremely important for you as you have various other trades and people walking on those uh, scaffolding and using that. Absolutely, when it comes to safety, uh, it's really uh, primordial because you wanna make sure that everyone is safe. We do wear our harnesses. We do have, we make sure also, like before the scaffold is built, the engineer already will review everything, making sure that the load bearing, uh, the live load, the dead load, like the equipment, everything is um, like to par. And then from there, when we're building it, everything is done properly. We have also the health and safety teams that are on site. We have our foreman, the journey people. So everyone is safe. That's great. Thank you. I know that that's always a, a question that comes up about the, the safety of some of the work. Uh, Steve, let's go over to you. Um, if you can provide us an overview of what the company uh, does, especially uh, in a high rise setting. Uh, I know finishing trim is, is probably just a part of it. So if you can give us an overview of the day to day and what those responsibilities are and what skills someone needs to be successful. Those were many questions in one. <laughs> Well, um, we start from the blocking, as you've seen in the video. We do all the blocking for all grab bars, uh, for to help hold up shower doors, uh, towel bars, toilet paper holders. Uh, and after the blocking stage, we start installing, uh, we do, we actually install metal frames as well. So all, every suite has a ready frame and we install the ready frame to the suite. And then we do all the, the casings, the baseboards, doors, door frames, all inside the suites. Um, we actually do all the surrounds in the corridors. So all the fancy mill work you see in the corridors, uh, we build them up, dress them up really nice. Um, we install all the metal doors and hardware, to all the stairwells, the underground. Um, for the roof, we do all the parapet blocking. So that's for the, the so the aluminum can attach to something, has something to adhere to. Uh, we actually help build the, the hoist stock. So the main platform that you uh, that you come up to, and there's an elevator that goes on the outside of the building. We do all the enclosures on the floor. 
And uh, we also do all the window protection. We build temporary doors and frames to keep all the cold out. Um, for a carpenter, you have to be willing to learn. You have to, um, you have to have a willingness to be dedicated. It, it's not a hard trade. You just have to be willing to learn mostly and you gotta be able to uh, pick up on things. You have to learn to use the tape measures first. Once you, lose, you learn to use the tape measure, that, that's your basis and then you can go from there. That's uh, great. We always have somebody working with somebody. So it's never you're thrown into the walls and and you just go on your own. You always have somebody side by side with you as your apprenticeship and someone teaching you and guiding you along the way. Yeah, and I think that's certainly one of the benefits. And and Paul, uh, uh, sort of a, an aside that uh, we'll come to you to to talk a little bit more about the apprenticeship uh, generally and what that looks like, because uh, I know that that is such a a great and unique model to have that mentorship um, alongside as you're learning. But before that, uh, Delia, we'll come to you to just uh, provide us a little bit more of an in-depth overview of those initial stages and uh, around the forming and the foundation, the external uh, side of it that uh, carpenters uh, might work on and what are some of those uh, skill sets that would make someone successful in that. Excellent. Uh, yes, forming essentially is just building boxes, very strong boxes that will house concrete. It could be on grade, it could be on the ground like the footings, or the boxes could be in the shape of columns and walls. And then we're going to build a structure that we're going to be building the slabs on top of it. So we have to build with different materials, different systems that are more beneficial for some applications than others, and we reuse the material a lot. So after they're, they're constructed, uh, concrete is placed inside the forms. And once the concrete has set up, once it's cured, we can remove the forms and we reuse a lot. So there's a lot of repetitious work that is done. So you can master it very quickly and you can perfect it in a very short period of time. And it, uh, it really helps uh, in the skill set level. Uh, one thing they really need is the dedication of the worker, because unlike other aspects of carpentry, we, have, we deal with concrete. And concrete is not forgiving at all. It's very heavy. Uh, the pressures in the walls are tremendous, and we have to uh, build the forms to, uh, to hold that. Uh, we give concrete shape, essentially. Uh, another huge problem with the concrete is that we have to order it days in advance, weeks in advance. And if we're working on a, a big civil job, even a month in advance, we have to have the uh, concrete plant aware of the requirements and the, the, the strengths and the amount of concrete that we need, and they have to have it ready for us. Uh, concrete sets up and it, it sets up in a very short period of time once it's mixed. So we have to be ready with our forms that when the concrete show, concrete trucks show up on site, it's ready to be placed in the, in the forms. So it's not like I wasn't ready, I'm sorry, can you wait an hour or can we do it tomorrow? Uh, there's thousands and thousands of dollars being wasted at that time. Uh, we need the dedication of the uh, employee to make sure he's there on time and to have a great attitude because it is a very difficult job in the fact that it's very strenuous, that um, uh, it's very tiresome. You, you get essentially a free workout out of a day's work and um, you, you have to be ready first thing in the morning. It's not like I'm not quite ready. Can we wait? No, we've ordered the concrete a week ago for today at two o'clock, for example. And this has to be ready because this is a very crucial part, but it's not the only part of the task. Having the people come and place the concrete in the forms and uh, overnight when it sets, the next day we can remove the forms and reset them again. That's how we could do in uh, ICI and when we're doing a, a typical, uh, we could do a floor a week on a building, which is pretty demanding, uh, not, outrageous but pretty demanding that we if we followed the schedule we can get it in on time and we can do these towers buildings uh, structures that's such a good point and i as you were talking about being on time i just uh, i had that echo in my mind that concrete truck waits for no one <laughs> yes. and i know everybody knows that so um I, I love the similarities between what steve said that you have to be dedicated you have to be on time you have to be willing to learn um which you know it's uh, it's interesting because i do want to point that out 
not technical skills. These are all foundation skills that um, are an example of a good work ethic and somebody who's passionate about their career. So the, the technical skills come with that, uh, starting with the reading the measuring tape and then and then build from there. But you can't you can't do that um, uh, without having that work ethic. Um, just to 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 wrap up this conversation, would it be fair to say um, that maybe in the in the scaffolding and forming work, you're a little bit more exposed to the elements where on uh, Steve, the scope of work that you talked about, uh, you might be a little bit more sheltered, or does that really depend on the day to day? Steve, maybe I'll go to you for that. Uh, we're mostly generally sheltered, so we're not really exposed to the elements, but. There's the occasional time, like as we build the hoist stock, uh, at that time you'll be exposed to the elements or you're doing the parapet blocking. Otherwise, generally we're mostly inside. And a lot of right. work, work too is all the millwork in the, in the lobby. So by the time you start doing the millwork in the lobby, the building is generally enclosed. That's good to know. I know we get that question a lot about um, being, yeah, being exposed to the elements, you know, rain, snow, sun. Um, so that's a good difference that we, we want to highlight. Uh, Paul, I'll come back to you now um, to talk a little bit more about the apprenticeship system and what some of the benefits of that training approach would be. I think we already heard a few of them. Um, and how does an apprentice become a journey person? So for us here in Canada, you will be looking at 7,200 hours of apprenticeship. Now for carpenters that are out in the trade, I'm, I'm sure the bulk of them will tell you that this trade requires you to learn for life. There's always new products, materials, different ways of doing things. You're working with other architects and engineers, and really it's a carpenter's job to, to help to make everybody else's dreams come true. You know, we're, we're following everybody else's leads. And, uh, you know, so it does take a lot of time and effort to become a carpenter. Like I said, you're, you're constantly growing. Um, our platform is based on four blocks of 1800 hours. So you would be considered to be a first year apprentice as you are working through that first 1800 hours of work. The second year would be uh, 18 to 3600 hours. The 36 to 5400 hours, you are now a third term apprentice. And then from the 5,400 to 7,200 hours, now you're working as a fourth year apprentice. <clears throat> Sorry, there's about a thousand hours of schooling involved in, in our trade. Now, what I am speaking of is a Red Seal certification in carpentry. We do have individuals, you know, out and working in the field, working in the trade that have not followed a formal apprenticeship right a general carpenter or a carpenter is is not a um well oh, sorry i'm looking for it it's it's not a compulsory trade so you could go out you know follow the formal education end of things which would require you to come into school and you know like i said about a thousand hours of schooling on the formal end yet we do have carpenters that that work out in the industry and perhaps have never taken any kind of formal programming everything was learned out on site so a few different paths in which you can go obviously we try to promote the general carpenters apprenticeship the red seal certification if you are somebody that was to gain that red seal certification that would give you the ability to work as a carpenter across the country. And our certification levels here in Canada are as good or better than the rest of the world. So you could take your certification, travel the world as a carpenter and you know enjoy some of that travel as you go. So a few, few different things you know, going on on that end, but um, really if you wanna get yourself moving in the trade, think to yourself that you will be learning for life. 
Well, that's uh, that sounds great to me personally, because otherwise that's just boring doing the same thing over and over again. Right. And I I think we can summarize uh, in one in one go to say carpentry is choose your own adventure. Uh, I guess that there's a there's a way for uh, everybody to to concentrate on what they're passionate about and what they're excited about. So um, just to get into a little bit more of the reality of these different options, I'd love for you, and some of you have spoken about this already, but I'd love to hear more about what the benefits and what some of the challenges might be for your particular area of carpentry. Again, just to be able to, to help individuals make the right decisions for them. Um, so Steve, why don't we go uh, to you and you can uh, sort of uh, talk about a little bit in the summary what some of the benefits are and what some of the challenges may be. Well, some of the challenges in carpentry is we do a lot of problem solving. Um, when I say problem solving, well, basically we learn every day. Carpentry is not, I can learn it once and I'm done. It's just learning to it every day. So every day I go home and I learn something new that day. Um, problem solving is just like, you might have millwork on a wall and you have to divide the, the panels equally. How to make them work, how we have grooves sometimes in panels, how to make them line up properly. Um, some other problem solving that you might have is just like installing doors and having them all line up perfectly. We're very meticulous in what we do, so especially in, in the, on the Finnish side. So um, really detail oriented. We're very detail oriented in trim carpenters for high rise. That's great. Um, a lot of the benefits are, is like I was saying, there's a lot of good aspects that when you learn at work, you can apply it back at home. It teaches you just even how to find a stud and hang up a picture frame. Very simple things, changing a lock on your door. Some things that some people might not understand and it's something that you learn at work and you use every day at home. Um, carpentry, if you're willing to learn and you're excited about learning something new every day, it's a beautiful trade. That's great. I love that uh, point about uh, the home renovations. I mean, I don't think people realize how much money that will save you uh, knowing how to do that. And unfortunately, I guess the drawback on that would be the friends and family that call you constantly <laughs> to come yeah. and help out. Just pretend to always be busy. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, Delia, we'll come over to you to talk a little bit about some of the benefits and challenges on the farming side. The benefits would be that if you meet the the requirements and you're you you like the work there's a lot of work in it so there's always employment and it it gives you a full day's work it's not a half a day here it, it's always a full day's work and you can come back the next day and there's more and more to do and another benefit is we're changing the skyline we are doing buildings we're doing things that'll outlast you your children your grandchildren and they can say that my dad my grandfather he worked on these buildings so it's very rewarding that way the challenge is, is definitely the weather. You, you talk to Steve and he works sometimes inside. If he's on the parapet, he has to be up on, on the roof of the building. So he is susceptible to the weather. We're always susceptible uh, to the weather. The weather is always, uh, we're always on the forefront. We're always placing concrete, uh, displacing air. We're, we're going vertical uh, and it's always either sunny or raining or snow or whatever the weather is. Uh, we're dealing with it on a constant basis. So that is always challenging for us. We, we try to get in our, our full week's uh, wait, our, our full week's work, but the weather is always telling us otherwise. Sometimes, and even in, in a week, it could be too hot and you can feel the weather changing and it's starting to get too cold and, and then the sporadic rain in between. So that can always impeach our uh, ability to work for that day. That's <clears throat> Sorry, that's a really good point. And I love what you said about, um, you know, seeing your work uh, in the skyline, because I think anybody in construction, I mean, what a rewarding experience to be able to point to a building and say, I helped build that, I think it is just one of the greatest things um, about any of these careers in, in construction, and especially uh, carpentry. Um, Rock, we'll go over to you now because I'd love to hear your perspective. You switched industries. You're a woman, um, you know, in this particular skilled trade. Tell us about your perspective and if you would recommend that to other women. Thank you. Absolutely. I would recommend it to every single woman. It is the perfect. The thing is, when it comes to um, carpentry, you get to 
learn and you get to face your fears. I used to be petrified of heights and now I'm gliding on the scaffold. However, it takes time. As long as you're curious, you're confident, determined and willing to learn as each of my uh, colleagues said here and um, the instructors, you will be able to do it. Uh, when it comes to like uh, Delio already mentioned the elements, right? We're working outside, it's cold, it's, it's raining, it's hot. However, like when you are with a great team, the day goes by really quick. You used to, you, you are able to go beyond your potential. You get to really hone your skills, develop yourself, learn every single day. As the, everyone mentioning, we problem solve we get to just be us and be our authentic self. So as long as you as a woman, you are willing to learn and you have a positive attitude, you're able to come on time, just be open-minded and you will see that you will succeed in this trade and you're able to do it. And I'm one of the, <laughs> the example, actually, I just love it. And when it comes to construction, it's tangible, like uh, Delia was saying. You will be telling people, I was there, I built that. You know, it's something that in years and years to come, your great great kids will see it because you're just telling them. Sometimes they, like uh, some of them would say, their children are tired of, uh, of hearing that, right? Because uh, it's something that us, we're just proud. So it's really rewarding. Um, and I would say, just, just come on. I think that's. Oh. I love that. Just come on. Well, I think I think what's so great is that uh, all of you uh, sort of uh, really are in agreement in terms of that this is really a physically uh, stimulating career because you are working with your hands uh, day in and day out, but also really intellectually stimulating career because you're problem solving. You are uh, constantly thinking about the, the the details and the big picture. So I think those are really, really great things to highlight. Uh, Paul, we'll come back to you for our uh, most popular question, which is the money. <laughs> so can you talk about uh, the pay structure and what the average starting salary may look like and then what the earning potential uh, is like? And if there's a difference between the different um, aspects of the trade as well. So on the wage end of things, everybody is, is always interested. Oh, yeah, what kind of money can I make now for? Myself, um, you know, I can I can say for for Dell and Rock, we are working with Carpenters Local 27. Okay, that's the Carpenters Union. So I can state some of the wages there. Now we have people obviously working in non-union, working in residential construction. You know, many different parts of it. So wages will honestly vary. You know, it'll vary based on people's skill sets the style of work that they're doing, the style of work that they want to be doing. You know, um, if you are involved with a construction union, then you're gonna be looking at benefits and pension, uh, you know, guaranteed wages on the non-union end of things. Perhaps, you know, you've got to fight a little bit to get a little bit more money on your end, or perhaps you could even be working in a piecework style of job where, you make a certain amount of money for the amount of work that you do. You know, if you're working in, in Steve's area of work, doing trims, people could be paid per foot of trim that they lay. It really just depends on, on what, um, you know, what wage is negotiated on that end of things. But I will give you a great, uh, you know, idea as to the wages that are being seen at the moment with Carpenters Local 27 and their workers are working in all different aspects of the trade. Okay, so we have first year apprentices, people that get out and keep themselves very busy. You could be looking between 40 to $50,000 a year. Okay, their starting rate ranges between about $21 to $23 an hour. It depends on the contract that you're working under and the area of work that you're doing. Um, concrete form work for us is the highest wage. Okay, they've got a, an adjusted contract again. Again, it, it, a lot of it's based on, on contract. 
So we'll say 21 to $23 an hour for a first year apprentice. As you move up into a second year role, you could be somewhere in the range of about 26 to $28 per hour. For our structure, you are required to complete basic level schooling to be able to move to a third year apprentice level. A third year apprentice at the moment would be earning between 30 to $33 per hour. The fourth year apprentice would be somewhere in the range of about 35 to $37 an hour. And then the journey person, 41 to $43 per hour. Now, a first year apprentice, when they reach 360 working hours, they'll be brought in for benefits. Benefits will help to cover hearing, dental, massage therapy, orthotics, pharmaceutical drugs, give you even some life insurance at that time. Once you reach 1800 hours, you are now brought in on a pension. Okay, so you start to earn a pension at that 1800 hour mark, and it is a percentage of the journeyman's wage is what you'd earn on that pension end. So it really does depend on the work that you're doing, the area that you're working, perhaps even the trade union that you work for as to what wages you will be seeing, um, you know, but for the bulk of carpenters out there, they're earning an honest living. It, it's, you know, dirty work, but clean money. So something that, uh, you know, is, is probably attractive to most. And yeah, the wages, wages are very good. Lots of overtime available as well. So we do see some carpenters, you know, that, that work seven days a week. It really depends on how much work you're willing to do timelines of the company and you know how much they're willing to pay out i uh, that was such a great overview and i think uh what many people don't realize and and one of the biggest strengths in the skilled trades is as you advance through your apprenticeship you don't have to bicker with your employer in a union advice uh, in a unionized environment you're automatically getting these promotions which i think is is so great and you know from a woman's perspective with rock there's pay equity as well because there's no journey journey woman or a journey man which i think is is another uh really great highlight but what a fantastic compensation package overall and uh again just to go back to the additional benefits that um all three of you here, and, and I know Rock will, will get there uh, sooner rather than later as well, have moved into management positions, into an instructor position. I'm sure there's lots of people that go on to own their own business and, and take on uh, renovation projects uh, for themselves. So just, uh, again, a lot of different uh, options uh, there. Um, Steve, can we uh, come to you now a little bit and just talk about the average hours uh, during the day and for the week? What, is, what does the schedule look like? Uh, actually, if I could touch on what Paul said. Uh, sure, of course. We're actually 183 in high-rise trim, so we're actually a different union. Um, but our pre structure is basically similar. We do every 1,800 hours as well. Our top rate, so that's a journeyman after five years, is actually forty-five dollars an hour. So we're slightly higher, but we have no piecework. So ours is all basically based on hours. Uh, you complete your work. There's no piecework uh, at all in in the high-rise towers. And our that's hours, are, yeah, our hours yeah. start at seven a.m. and we work till three fifteen. We take uh, one break in the morning at nine o'clock, and we have a half-hour unpaid lunch. And we skip our last 15 minute break so we can just go home 15 minutes early. That's what we do through 15. <laughs> I, I the like traffic. That. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you start early, you end early. That's uh, that's a great way. Yeah. But usually a hard, the hardest adjustment we, we find with young people for that uh, start Starting time. Starting 7 a.m. Yeah, as we said, the uh, concrete truck waits for no one. So. Yeah. Luckily, we um, don't have concrete, concrete trucks. Yeah, right. <laughs> you still can't be late, though, right, Steve? No, you cannot be late. You have to be willing, right. you have to, be willing uh, to start at 7 a.m. And, and go. 
That's uh, that's fantastic. And uh, Delio Rock, uh, is there a difference in those hours for you guys? Do you start at around the same time or a little bit earlier, a little bit later? Rock, uh, how about you? Or um, when I was doing form work, it, we were starting at 7 a.m. and finish at 3.15. And now uh, with, uh, with scaffolding, we start at 7.30 to um, three, 4 o'clock. And then sometimes, depending on the site, because sometimes we will go to different sites where we will start from 6.30 and finish at mm. 2 o'clock. It depends. It just changes depending on where you work. And if we work to, in an area where it's residential, we will start at 8, 8.30, and then finish later. And if we're doing overtime, we do overtime, like uh, Paul was saying. Right, so so a little bit more of a, of a range there. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Delio, any any difference on your end? Very similar, very similar. The only thing that varies, again, it's that weather. So in the summer, when it's really hot, they might opt to start at 6 o'clock, some places even 5 o'clock, just so they can finish at high noon because that's the hottest part of the day and mm. they don't want to work that, you can't work that afternoon shift. They'll just be too grueling. It'll be added more fatigue unnecessarily. So they'll start the day earlier. And in the winter, when before we uh, change the hour, it's still dark out. So they might opt to start at 7.30 or possibly eight. Uh, again, the conditions are, are very um, deciding on our work. Uh, over time, yeah, if, if uh, if there's a, a push on the job that they were falling behind because of weather, uh, they'll start, they want to stay on schedule because the other trades are going to be, they have a set date to start as well. So they will be overtime. And if there's a, a crazy build, a crazy build would be, uh, we want this done as quickly as possible. As soon as we get tenants, uh, they'll start paying the rent and they'll start offsetting the cost. So there are, unique situations that they'll be doing a 24 hour construction. So they'll either be in two shifts or only in three shifts and you'll be working, there'll be workers nonstop uh, building it. So you'll start at seven, you'll start at, at 3.30, uh, you'll start eight hours after that and there'll be three shifts coming in. So there'll be a, a shift premium uh, or there'll be overtime uh, if they lap over uh, so that would be slight difference, but everything else pretty much starts. Seven is a, an excellent time to start in construction and three, 3.30 is the, uh, an eight hour day on that. That's great. Thank you for that. Again, you know, probably the most uh, physically demanding part of carpentry, but lots of uh, flexibility and accommodation there. So that's really great to hear. Uh, Rock, uh, one last question for you before we, we switch into how do we get there? Um, so you just changed uh, careers, you know, into this, uh, you're getting started. You must have heard lots of things about a career in carpentry. So I'd love to do a, a fun question and hear what was something that you heard about a career in carpentry that turned out to be completely wrong, like a stereotype? I love that question. It would be, uh, this is not for women. Uh, you, you're not strong enough. You will not be able to do what we do. And it's definitely 100% not true. It's true for the first week, months, you really, your muscles are not developed yet. But you know how the human anatomy is. Uh, the, the body will just, the, the muscle will just work. And uh, from there, you become stronger and stronger. At first, I couldn't even left those heavy <laughs> standards and afterwards it was just it's just easy you you do two three together and then you're working just like everybody else or the other thing was you're uneducated and not educated people who are not educated will go into the trade 100 percent not true a lot of problem solving a lot of calculation a lot of uh you need to know your math like grade 12 math to start with us at the uh, as a general carpenter so yeah know your mat if you don't know the school they're amazing the CCAT they'll be able to teach you train you and then yeah so it's really good well that's fantastic I think those are two really good points and I, I am personally jealous I think you're probably in far better shape than I am 
<laughs> so I think somebody said it, the, the added benefits of, uh, of a two-in-one, uh, you work out on your job, so you get to skip the gym, which is, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, all right, so I'd like to move us over to the last uh, part of our segment, which is, I think we, you, you've provided us such a fantastic overview of the many different options that are available within um, carpentry. And I'd love to talk about how uh, young people that are interested actually get there. So Paul, we'll throw it back to you. Um, what do you look for when you're assessing new applicants to start their training? Are there any basic requirements? Do they need a high school diploma? Do they need to be good at math? If you can provide us that overview. Okay, for people to get themselves a registered apprenticeship contract, you actually do not need to finish high school. You need to have a grade 10 education. 16 credits is actually what it is at. Now, like Rock had just finished saying, we are working in all different areas of the trade. We're working with a lot of math involved and the math of a general carpenter would that would be that of probably a grade 12 level. Now, a lot of people would be able to achieve it. Uh, for us at the college, we offer tutors for all different programs and stuff. And as long as you are willing to put forth the work, you will be successful. What I look for when, when I'm speaking with individuals really is the drive to be there. You know, do you really want to be there? Are you coming to me because you want a job or are you becoming to me because you would like to start a career? And there's, there's two different, you know, things there. So I look for people that, that want to be involved in the trade, um, people that are willing to put the time and effort in. You know, I, I have had many people that, um, you know, they say to me, oh, I don't know if I'm cut out for it. And I tell them, give it a chance, try it out. You know, you may find something of it that, that you really enjoy. And there are so many different aspects of our trade for people to move into. So if you don't like one area, you can move and, and try something else. So, so really the most important thing is that willingness to learn, a drive to succeed. That's really what's going to get you moving in the, in the carpentry trade. That's great. And I saw Steve nod uh, over there on a couple of the things that you said. So Steve, I'll come over to you uh, as an employer in the space. What do you look for uh, in a new apprentice? Are there different basic requirements on your end? Basically what Paul said, we, we want somebody that's dedicated, that willing to learn is the biggest thing. Because every day is, there's something new. So I call it exciting. I like different challenges personally. So every day there's something new and challenging. It, it's repetitive work, but it, it, at the same time, it's not repetitive work in the sense that not one suite is the same. Not one door, installing a door is the exact same. Um, basically, just somebody that's really, really dedicated and willing to learn and, and that's pretty much it. That's the rest great. Can be taught. The rest can be taught. Dedication you can't teach. That's right. And I love I love what Paul said as well about, you know, this is not just a job. This is an opportunity to really build a career, because what I heard from all of you is the more uh, you do it, the more you learn, the more responsibilities you get, the more you advance. So if you're just looking for a job, I, um, as I say to some of the young people that say that to us, I'm sure, there's a Starbucks down the street <laughs> somewhere where you can. <laughs> that's hiring. Um, so if. Uh, Interested individuals, uh, how do they get started? Uh, if I'm a young person and you've completely sold me on this career, uh, what's next for me? What do I get to do? So uh, Paul, we'll, we'll come back to you for that. For, for us, you can reach out to the College of Carpenters and Allied Trades. Um, we will do some pre-assessment testing, make sure that you know your English math is is up to par. If it's not, then we definitely have other ways to help you bring up some of your skills to get moving. Um, our assessment testing does also help us realize where people are at and, and where they can grow. So you can reach out to us at the College of Carpenters and Allied Trades. Um, 
reach out to myself. I, I'm more than happy to get people started, keep them moving, you know, answer questions, what whatever they're needing, you know, reach out and I, I'm more than happy to help. That's fantastic. Thanks. And Steve, I'll put you on the spot again, um, because you did say that you're with Local 183. So on that side, um, how do interested individuals get to get started? Uh, you would have to sign up with Local 183. And then Local 183 will actually help you uh, get in touch with the different companies. You can also reach out to our companies every see for hiring. We do, we, we do try to help, uh, especially through the Bold program, program, we try to help. We try to help both, both students. We actually just hired a both student last week, and he's he's great. He's fantastic. Huh, good. <laughs> that saves me a phone call. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, so uh, this is all the time we've had for for today. I have just one more question uh, for all of you, um, and I'll give you thirty seconds uh, each to answer that. And that is, what is your advice to anyone who's interested in pursuing a career in carpentry? And Rock, we'll, uh, we'll start over with you. Sure, absolutely. To start, I would say just be curious, take that step, and you have the full potential to be whoever you want to be. So just come on board. We'll definitely um, like help you and you will grow and you will build an amazing career in construction. So come on. I love that. Uh, Delia, over to you. Piece of advice. It's attainable for anybody. Uh, it's fun work. It's rewarding work. Uh, I've had so many students and other people that I worked with that um, they thought it wasn't for them until they gave it a try. And then they just seen how rewarding and how pleasurable it is. It's, it's, it's hard work. It's not easy. But your it's at the end of the day you can see your accomplishments give it a try i love that uh steve over to you um ask a lot of questions and be patient you won't learn everything overnight patience is a big key that's a that's fantastic and, more and questions you can ask, questions. sorry the more questions you ask the more you'll learn that's great advice uh paul we'll end over with you if construction is where you'd like to be, carpentry, the trade of choice, be persistent and advocate for yourself. Make sure that people know that you want to be there. Unfortunately, there are only a small amount of people that help to get others involved in the trade. They're not trying to ignore anybody by any means, but with so many people moving around, if you don't advocate for yourself, Unfortunately, you could get lost in the in the mix. I love that. That's such great advice from everyone. Thank you so much. That's all the time we had for today. Um, thank you for joining us for this episode of the series. And be sure to keep an eye out for our next one that will discuss careers as a construction craft worker. A recording of this discussion will be posted on Bolt's YouTube channel, as well as the Speak Out page on our website, boltonline.org. I want to once again thank our industry panel who took time out of their very busy days to share their insights, experience, and advice. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.